What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged, and we like to get scared together. Yeah. This week, we're doing a movie that was requested a bunch. Mm, oh, a whole bunch. Because you, you got it in the comments a ton. I got a bunch of emails about it. Yeah, especially because I did Wreck, and then all the comments were like, oh, well, if you're doing Spanish movies, how about... Mm-hmm. El Hoyo. Yeah, the platform. Even though El Hoyo means the whole, which is its Spanish makes title, sense. which makes sense to me because while we were watching it, they kept referring to the whole and never really to a platform, even though there is a central platform that moves within the whole. Mm-hmm. The platform came out last year. I think it premiered at Toronto. Yes. Uh, Toronto International Film Festival in September of last year, and it was purchased uh, for release by Netflix. Yes. And I always know something is a new Netflix (laughs) uh, (laughs) release because that's when we just get like a flood of requests for a specific movie that I know isn't in theaters. Yeah. It's like, I know I've I've never heard of this, but all of a sudden tons of people are requesting it. It's on Netflix. Yeah. And I, I had no idea what it was. I went into it not knowing anything about it didn't know it was a spanish movie so that was a surprise when oh, the yeah. subtitles popped up it's like <laughs> oh cool okay um i did know the basic premise because i did google it uh just to yeah, see what it was i got the one line synopsis of yeah it, which and I, is... I instantly was very intrigued because it yeah it is a it's a prison where the inmates on the top levels are given this platform of food to eat first and the platform descends through each floor you can eat as much as you want from the platform and so therefore probably you... there for like t- five minutes maybe yeah if yeah. that and then yeah so by the bottom the people at the bottom don't get any food yeah it's not a subtle metaphor but i don't necessarily mind yeah so that's that's one of the things about this movie is it's definitely a movie where the uh the message is the primary thing that it's doing. In fact, I read that it was based on an unproduced stage play. I had the thought while I was watching this that this would be an incredible play. Yes, and it was based on unproduced stage play, and they had to add more action to make it filmable. Mm -hmm. And apparently the director... And see, this is why I get so worried covering foreign films is because... One, I'm not as familiar with these people because, like, the the actors in here, some of them are in a whole bunch of Spanish yeah. movies, and I, I I can't speak with any authority on what they're normally doing. But mm-hmm. uh, the director Galder Gastello, oh, yeah, we're Ur- about to fuck up a bunch. Of oh yeah, Rutia, uh-huh. which I believe this is his first feature film. Mm-hmm. Uh, he made music videos and stuff before that, but he said that he had some difficulty um, adapting the the script because the original writers were so bent on maintaining their message, which I think is probably a good thing because, uh, yeah. That's that's a funny thing, like a funny conflict to consider, like thinking about what the third act of this movie then becomes about preserving the message of something. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's interesting. That is funny. Yeah, so definitely if you're going to watch it, which I recommend, it's... Uh, I would recommend it, too. I liked it. It's cool, 95 minutes. If you like minutes. Snowpiercer... Yes. This is, I mean, this movie, not to discredit this movie at all, because it is very good, but it, it, if you want to sell it to someone, it's, what if Snowpiercer, but sideways... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because in Snowpiercer, they're moving horizontally throughout the train, yeah. and this is like this a is vertical. A building. Yeah, it's yeah. a skyscraper, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, another thing it reminded me of is I just finished rereading Franz Kafka's The Trial. Uh-huh. And Kafka, if you're familiar with his work, uh, deals with like Byzantine administrative bureaucracies and the irrational the irrational like facets of those things and at least in uh the trial it's been a while since i've read any other work of his but the the protagonist is kind of this like personality list person whose only purpose is to really like point out the flaws and try to fix and ultimately like uh, be unable to change any of the thing around him. And that's kind of how I feel about our main character, Goring, here. Mm-hmm. Because he's not really... He doesn't have too much of a personality. Or really, I would say, he doesn't really have flaws. He's like this this uh, 
ideal in person form yeah who you follow because like throughout this movie he's like well we should probably take care of the people below us and it's the other characters yeah, who kind the, of bounce things off of him they even kind of mockingly call him a messiah at yes. certain points um yeah i also thought too of the divine comedy a little bit um i don't know how much of that is intentional but Especially like the the numbers in this are weird. Like there's a th- a floor three three three, which is kind of bizarre that that's the bottom floor. And I know, and I'm not super familiar with the Divine Comedy, but I know in that the like number three is really important. And he in that Dante is guided by three different people, and in this he is guided by three different people as well. So oh, in the Divine yeah. Comedy, there's Virgil, Beatrice, and Saint Bernard. They each take him to hell, purgatory, and heaven. And then in this, you have like the his, the first guy, Trimagasi, who, who is the, the best. best. We all love <laughs> Trimagasi. Uh, I forget the second woman's name. A lot of these names, I even I'm looking at the IMDb, I'm like, how the fuck do I pronounce these? I don't know. <laughs> Imagura? Imag- Imaguri? Imaguri, yeah. And then the third is... Uh, Baharat? B- yes. Yes. And so he's got kind of these three... I don't know. Oh, wow. And they do kind of correlate to hell, purgatory, and heaven, I would say. A little bit. Because Tiram- uh, Trimagasi is very much uh, like spitting down on the platforms mm-hmm. below him, willing to do whatever to survive. Uh, the he, middle- he does end up meeting him at the bottom at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the middle woman is the administrative figure, very neutral. Uh, yeah, she's trying to... Because she, she purposely goes to the hole and is like i'm gonna change it from the inside i'm gonna put myself through it to change it you know so that's almost a purgatory kind of vibe and then the third guy is our i mean he is like one of the more objectively good characters in this he even has a kind of religious angle to him he is seeking to move upwards and pitches himself as a as a man of god and he kind of uses that as his reasoning for wanting to move upwards and out. But then he ultimately, he is the one who helps um, Goring enact his plan and is kind of the good guy. And I liked him. I got super attached to him yeah. immediately. And that's a strength of this movie is I think the characters in it are for as much as they're these kind of walking, talking allegories, which it, sometimes when you're trying to do, it's hard to make them human enough for you to care about. I cared about all these people. Um, regardless of how flawed they were like if I, i'm able to get attached to a character in the third act of a movie that's pretty nuts yeah yeah so, so i don't know if the divine comedy stuff is on purpose but i definitely i think it's it's fine this movie is definitely one that the director intended to be as a springboard for discussion and debate yeah which is probably what a lot of this podcast is going to be because the movie is uh pretty nakedly a metaphor for Capitalism. Capitalism, class. wealth distribution, yeah. the class system for sure. This is a political movie. Mm-hmm. I was briefly looking at some stuff from the director talking about how it is, you know, as much as it is an indictment of capitalism, um, like right, like conservative social poli- policies. It's a, it's also a critique of some leftist movements too, especially violent leftist movements. So mm-hmm. it's, but yeah, I just played the game Disco Elysium, which I'm I was really moved by. I still think about it a ton. And this movie reminds me of that game in that they are, I think, both coming from kind of leftist perspectives, but they are willing to address the issues inherent to all kinds of different social movements, even ones that they consider a step in the right direction, that often there is violence inherent to a social shift and there is, you know it's complicated and human humans are complicated. Human nature is complicated and it can be really fraught. Do you know what I mean? Even if it's, you know, if it's a shift towards something you believe is right, often it can be really messy and that's hard to reckon with. And I mean, I guess we could just start at the beginning. We've kind of set up the themes and then we could go through and uh, touch on them more as we go through the, I think that'll be best. I think the, the movie does a really good job of kind of, 
having its themes and what it's trying to say unfold as the movie progresses. So it might be a little messy to just talk about the whole thing at once. I think this for this movie, it's useful to kind of go through sure. the progression of the plot, especially S- since it's so allegorical. So our protagonist, Goring, who kind of looks like Serge Tonkin. A little he bit does there. look like Serge Tonkin, <laughs> which is he's the perfect face then for this kind <laughs> of... Um, I guess the actor movement is, of the people. I guess the actor is a well-known Spanish actor who does a lot of comedy, and that okay. he was cast against type. Same thing with the administrative character, uh, the woman who he yeah. meets with. Uh, she was also a, a comedy actor. Oh so wow, that's interesting. Yeah, but Goring wakes up and he's in a cell on level forty-eight with this guy who I saw one reviewer call Spanish Hannibal Lecter. I saw I saw that great. review too. Yeah, and I it's adore him. Trimagasi. He is uh, yeah. I don't know why he's probably around sixty. Yeah, he's an a older guy. Sixty year old guy and he is fucking great. Yes. And uh th- he kind of gives Goring and the audience an explanation of what's going on, where they are. They're on level 48, which is, you know, 48 stories down. And yeah, and a... that means nothing to us yet. No. Yeah. But I mean, he, he explains pretty quickly that there's a slab that comes through the hole in the middle of the room and it's got food and it, it's when it gets to their floor, it's all picked over and it's all like, uh, you know, just kind of leftovers from the people who ate above them. It looks them. like the leftovers of a medieval feast or something. Yeah, but that doesn't stop Trimagasi from digging right in and mm-hmm. eating everything up. And yeah. Goreng is kind of, uh, he's he's opposed to it at first because it's all leftovers, but he does take a clean apple and he says, I'll eat it later. The platform descends further to the next level and then their room starts to get super hot because he took that apple. And if you take food for later, yeah, it'll heat up or cool down as a deterrent, you are not allowed to save food. You can only eat when the platform's there. Yeah, this this movie does a good job at addressing questions I had about, because, you know, it's human nature watching a movie. You're going to be like, well, why wouldn't you just take some food and save it for later? You mm-hmm. can't because they will literally bake you to a crisp or freeze you. It depends on what they're feeling that day, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so things like that, it does a pretty good job at answering. And I love, too, that it's implied just through the way that this building functions that this is in some either alternate reality, future reality. It's some weirdo sci-fi universe because the way this platform works is it just levitates through the middle of this building. Oh, yeah. I guess there isn't any kind of cable system. There's no cables. There's no... We don't know the mechanism. Oh, yeah. Magnets. I don't know. Also, by the end, we find out, like like you said, there are 333 stories. Yeah. Uh, The tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. I think that's got like 160 stories. So this is like twice the height of the tallest building. Yeah. So that doesn't make sense. Right. So it's definitely got to be some kind. I mean, it's a science fiction horror dystopian film. Yeah. See, that's the thing. And I I think... um, I haven't read too many reviews of this because I didn't want to color my perspective mm-hmm. on it, but I just have a hunch that it's one of those things like Snowpiercer where people are like, this is this would never be able to exist. And it's like, that's not the point. You have to <laughs> yeah. look at it like it is it is an allegory and it's fine that there's no fucking way there would be this building that's 333 stories tall and, you know, like no way could a country build a system, like a prison system that looks like this and function although maybe who knows you know there's there's a lot of surreal stuff going on here that if you start to nitpick it it's that's not really the point it's not supposed to be a realistic movie i don't think yeah and this thing is i guess a pre- it, they call it a vertical self management center yeah okay and <laughs> trimagasi is in there for a year he says because he got mad at his tv and threw it out the window, and it killed a guy. Right, because he saw some infomercials that he felt duped by. Because what happened was he saw an infomercial for a knife sharpener. He buys the knife sharpener. Then it's the same guy on a different infomercial saying, I'm selling you this knife that will never go dull. So why the fuck did I buy this knife (laughs) sharpener? That's when he loses it and throws his TV out the window. And what happens is his TV hits an illegal immigrant kills him and that's yeah, what sends him to the hole color commentary from tree yeah, in there too but what i think that is meant to illustrate is i think tree for because you know obviously the hole is meant to symbolize and i mean by the hole i mean the building it's what they call the building is the hole um 
I think he's meant to symbolize he's he's older, he buys into the, the system, or if he doesn't buy into it, he at least has given into it. And he's the type of person that's like, look, if you play by the rules, you'll live, you know? And so he he looks at, you know, well, the illegal immigrant, he was an illegal immigrant. He shouldn't have been there in the first place. So why was I guilty? I was following all the rules. That guy wasn't. I shouldn't be here. So he's the kind of, he, he gives Goring all of the rules and he is like, look, it's how it is how it is. He's never the one who is who wants to change anything, even if he thinks it's bullshit. He's constantly, he spits in, in the food and stuff before it goes down to the next floor because, well, the people above do it. It's just how it is. He's the it is how it is type of person. Yeah, because Goring's like, Why, why'd you do that? Uh, what if the people above us did that? And he's like, they probably do. So I'll do it too. Right. You know, the people below us are below us. He is a completely static person and i think yeah the the kind of yeah the coloring in of his story of him accidentally killing an illegal immigrant serves to make us realize that he's like look if you're not in the right place like all of us have our proper place to be and this is just how it is and if you're not acting the way it's supposed to be then that's your fault and also when goring suggests that maybe they uh, if everyone took a fair share of the food, everyone would have enough to eat. The first thing Trimagasi says to him, are, are you, are a, you communist? a communist? So, right. yeah. yeah, he's definitely he like the... the status quo. He also has a catchphrase, obvio, obviously, obvio, yeah. which I really love. And yeah, that kind of, you know, maybe speaks to how uh, people who are fine with the status quo and who can live with it, like it's obvious to them because it's the way it is. Yeah. And that it reminds me so much of how people rationalize like, well, if you don't have money why don't you have a job that's how it's supposed to be you get a job you get paid why if you're poor why don't you get a job that's the system that's what we set up get a job if you're hungry go buy food with the job you should have Mm -hmm. oh you can't get a job go to school like you know it's it's the system is there if you play by the rules you should be able to do everything the way it needs to be done yeah yeah but it's not only a correctional facility because Goring is there voluntarily. He joined. Yeah. And th- so this is a, a thing that I have. Uh, we have Trimagasi explaining everything to Goring. But Go- wouldn't Goring already know all this by volunteering? Or I guess a possible reason is you volunteer to go to what you only know as the vertical self-management center, yeah. not I d- knowing the people details. Don't re- well, yeah, even the people, as we found out later, who run it and who accept applicants for this uh they don't know what it's like in here either so um from the outside it all looks peachy and mm -hmm. i think of the idea of we again in this movie is an indictment of of capitalism and that kind of structure the director himself is like that it's clearly what this is fucking don't get mad at the us for pointing that out i just know people are gonna bitch about us making it political when like it's fucking political. i mean it's, it's a sorry. very political movie it was uh, made to be yeah such so uh and it reminds me of this this magical idea we sell of capitalism where it's the the invisible hand of the market type bullshit where it is the vertical self-management center it all should work itself out because that's the point is it's meant to make everyone in this structure work together to make sure everyone gets fed and you know, you're kind of left to your own devices to make everyone work together, and that doesn't work. Yes, when everyone enters it, whether voluntarily like Goring or uh, as opposed to, didn't Trimagasi, he had an option of either a, like a psych ward or this? Yeah. or this, yeah. So when you enter, you get to take one item in with you, yeah. and Goring takes Don Quixote, Don Quixote yeah. which, uh, you know, speaks to uh what his character eventually becomes you know you could even cast these two as a live action don quixote (laughs) and sancho panza down to their physical descriptions from the book don quixote is very lithe and and skinny handsome uh he's the idealist he's a bit romantic um but then you have sancho panza who is short squat uh he kind of is always not, not bringing don quixote down but he is Maybe bringing him down to earth is what I mean, is he's kind of the voice of reason. And that's how he functions here is he's like, okay, mister, uh, you know, you got these big lofty ideas. We can all ration the food and get me, you know, that's not how this works. Yeah. And you're going to find that out soon once you've been in here more than a month. And Trimagasi's item, obviously, 
was his self sharp samurai plus yeah samurai plus <laughs> knife blade yes so he's got this sharp ass knife with him the whole time that is one of my favorite things about this movie is as we later descend through some levels we get to see all the stuff people brought with them and yes. there are some questionable items so people why brought. would that guy bring a surfboard guy who brought a surfboard's <laughs> my absolute favorite chill king one guy brought like just a he's ton vibing. of money yes just, like a ton stacks of, cash. of money which i love is the most I, I I love that little bit because he's they he, they descend on the platform and he sees them and he's like look I'll give you money yeah help me and he starts throwing money at them as they pass through and it's just your money's no good here you know <laughs> it's in this this economy money's fucking fake you know when money has no value mm-hmm. we, they, you know like money's not real in this building it serves no purpose therefore this guy just brought in a bunch of paper for no fucking reason the last really important aspect of this that trimagasi fills us all in on is the fact that after a month Mm -hmm. they will be randomly relocated to another level and so he says hey we're on 48 that's a good level we still get food at this level I was on 132 before. Yeah. No food gets down there. Yeah. And so immediately, uh, Goring's like, well, then you probably killed yeah, your cellmate, you're look, right? You're not, you know, you're short and squat and adorable. I think Turing out is so, <laughs> such a cutie. And he's like, you don't look like you've been starving for a month. And also you keep your cellmate. Yes, and you yet, keep your cellmate. And yet actually. Goring just woke up with Trimagasi. Yeah, so what happened to that dude's cellmate? Mm-hmm. Two and two together. Yeah. We find out later that Trimagasi didn't kill his cellmate. There was, and I forget the exact situation because I didn't write it down. There's a lot going on in this movie. Uh, it's a lot of stuff crammed into an hour and a half. Uh, they they were able to eat someone who I think fell. Okay, yeah, because they do see someone fall through. Someone yeah. from an upper level who apparently either killed themselves or uh, were thrown out by their cellmate, mm-hmm. uh, which would make sense. More food for them, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, he says that he just managed to eat someone who came down yeah and that's how he's still alive yeah and i forget what ha- actually happened to his cellmate but he says that you know i'm not a murderer but this is you know i ended up yes i did eat a person but it's like the system made me do it which fair i guess it did sure yeah and they they say that people will jump from the higher levels because you you're once you're up there there's nothing to look forward to which i don't get i don't get that reason i do because when you're on the very top so imagine you're you wake up on like floor three or something yeah. and you get tons of food every day. The thing that's maybe keeping you going on these lower levels is like, I guess statistically, I'll be on a higher level than I am right now. Okay. And if you're on three, you know that at the end of this month, you're going I'm, down. I'm going down. Like odds are I'm not going to end up on one, two or three again. Mm. I'm going to be on a lower floor. Okay. And that is what makes you kind of go nuts on those higher floors and probably gorge and you have so much time to think you don't have time to look forward to at least next month i'll probably be on a better level Mm -hmm. instead it's next month i'm gonna be in a worse yeah situation and it reminded me a little of this um this book that i love uh called hope for the flowers it's like a picture book but it's like meant for grown-ups it's like this little allegory about these caterpillars that make these um like towers of caterpillars and they can never figure out why but the whole thing is like they all become obsessed with getting to the top and once they i think the main caterpillar gets up to the top and he sees that there's not anything up there it's just a tower because because everyone is convinced there's something up there and so once you get up there you realize like oh my god i have what do i look forward to like the mystery of the top of the tower is gone and there's nothing up here and like what do i do you know so it just it made me think of that it's not quite the same allegory but it made me think of that mm-hmm. and it's kind of the maybe the idle rich the bored rich when you have everything in the world what else could make you happy okay yeah sure uh yeah they they end up becoming kind of friendly with each other uh oh there's a little friends montage the friends montage is great there's some friends some man ass and some floppy dong in there yeah because you know what else you're gonna do they're like Get doing naked, naked exercises stretch, together and they and uh Goring reads Don Quixote to him out loud to Trimagasi. Yeah, they also at this point, at some point, see Miharu, which is a woman who is sitting on the platform as yes. it descends through them. And uh, Trimagasi says, ignore her. She does this every month. Just eat, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so they ignore her. She goes down to the next level and Goring sees that she's attacked uh, by the 
the two below him Mm -hmm. and he even thinks about jumping down there to save her yeah because they clearly it's these two dudes who grab her they're gonna go they're gonna rape her yeah but she takes care of herself and just fucking murders both of them yeah so and that's yeah when we find out that she is on this platform every month and she's purposely kills her cellmate whoever it is that she wakes up with Mm -hmm. because she needs to have an excuse to stay in because her and the subtitles say it's her boy who is here i saw on reddit that this may be a translation error because it could just be child and not boy uh that wouldn't make sense to me because it's spanish is a gendered language so i don't know i don't yeah but also at the end i mean spoiler alert they they do find A a girl and he says like oh it's a girl yeah so i I think it's it should be boy, but I don't know. Maybe yeah, I don't know. The, this is like the stuff with the kid gets a little muddled. The stuff with for Maharu, me. I'm not entirely sure what to think about it. Yeah, she's interesting. She's very violent. I'll have. I think maybe I'll have more to say about her as we get. Okay. More. Oh, and also, I think I forgot to mention why Goring volunteered to go in here. It's because after six months, he'll get an accredited diploma. Right. And I'm not sure what the purpose of it is, uh, why they would offer a reward for someone volunteering to enter. Maybe just data. You know, you're you're a member of this experiment and we need people for the experiment. So we'll reward you with a diploma if you come in and offer your to live through this, I guess. Yeah, I could believe, too, that they need to keep it filled <laughs> like at all times if it's. I mean, I, I could see this being a for-profit facility. If they're like, shit, we get money for keeping people in here kind of thing. Like, yeah. we have for-profit prisons and stuff. Mm-hmm. And all right, if we can get people to come here voluntarily and, and dangle this, you know, diploma in front of them. I don't know. It's my theory. Yeah. But so anyway, we know that he has six months to go. So his first month is on level 33. With Trimagasi. And then one night they're going to sleep and Trimagasi's like, you smell that gas? Mm-hmm. Well, that's going to knock us out. And when we wake up, we'll be on a different level. See you in the morning. Yeah. He wakes up on level 171. 171 and he's tied to the bed. Oh, yeah, he is. Trimagasi says, you're a very deep sleeper. Tied you to the bed. Um, You know, I'm doing this for my own safety, honestly. I'm an old man. You're a young man. You could easily get my knife and kill me. So if you cooperate and you are chill, I will not kill you. Instead, I will, you know, I'll starve myself for a week because we're not getting any food down here. Mm -hmm. No, they are not. (laughs) We'll both just starve ourselves for a week. And then after that, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to start eating bits of you. You know what? I think this is rational. And I think this is the best case scenario I kinda of what think you could hope too. for. I'm like, well, okay, Tree Magasi, that makes sense. And that's the thing is I think this this movie and this <laughs> story, because it, it was also a play first, this story does such a good job of getting you to understand why certain people do things that when you're not in their situation. So we look at, um, you know, there's high crime rates where there are high poverty rates like poverty and crime Mm -hmm. are kind of linked and it's easy to cast judgment on that level of poverty and that level of crime and it's easy to condemn it and but this movie I think is such a good way to kind of demonstrate how things like this like we just both agreed cutting pieces off someone <laughs> to eat them to stay alive in this situation is the best you could hope for nice and for thing. people in real life sometimes a life of crime is the best they can hope for and is the least destructive thing that they can do because they need to fucking survive mm-hmm. and when you have a situation like this movie is a metaphor for where you are living in inescapable poverty you're at the bottom of the tower Mm -hmm. you you know you gotta do what you need to do to survive yeah and something that is looks insane to someone on the outside or on an upper level makes sense when you're in that situation yeah yeah i love the uh like bizarro version of their friendship montage that we get here where it's just goring tied up and trimagasi like he's like dancing on the empty food platform. I love platform, him dancing on the platform. And he's reading Don Quixote. And uh, yeah, it's it's like a real weird warped version of that fun montage. And I love the music during them it's too. Go- it's so, so good. good. And- yeah, we don't have clips for this episode because it's a Netflix movie. Yeah, sorry. But 
But uh, he, yeah, and he also just reemphasizes during this whole part, look, the system's making me do this. It's, yes. Again, the, none of this is a like subtle metaphor. But Goring but so does good. hold him personally accountable. Goring he does. says, I blame you, not the system. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. Yeah, I think because Goring um, at this point, I wonder if Goring later would feel the same way. I don't think he would. I think that's kind of his character development in this. Okay. Because I think Goring now... Up to this point, this first day on level 171, is, is that where they're at, 171? Uh, when yeah, they're on 48, they're mm-hmm. eating every day. They are in, they're the middle class of this tower, mm-hmm. like maybe even upper middle class because there's 333 floors. But so it's easier for him to say, no, I'm still holding you accountable for this. Like, yeah, it's, this is the, the system that we're in, but this is still a fucked up thing for you to do. I don't think he's hit that level of desperation that Trimagasi has experienced at this he was point. On he's been here for before, months. Yeah. yeah. And he's been on lower floors. Yeah. I think the the goring of the last half of this movie would be a bit more understanding. Okay. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Trimagasi finally goes to cut off some of that delicious goring meat, uh, he only gets a little bit of the way in before fucking uh, Maharu, Mi- Maharu yeah. shows up and she she stops him and slits his throat mm-hmm. and then frees Goring, who then murders the shit yeah, out of Trimagasi. He stabs, stabs Trimagasi the hell out of him. pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah, and Maharu, I think, you know, she, she goes to save Goring because Goring did... Express try- kindness. Yeah. yeah. And he wanted to go save her, and he did, yeah, express some empathy mm-hmm. toward her. So Trimagasi's dead, but luckily it's not the last we see of him because we get yeah. him coming back. His I was real worried vision. when he died. I was like, no, I was loving this dude's performance. I love the inclusion of people as like apparitions and ghosts and stuff. Yeah, just haunting Goring's consciousness. And yeah, conscience. especially because he ends up eating him, and he's like, yeah, I'm part of you forever now. Right, I'm in you now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, although he he also not only eats Trimagasi's body, which uh, Maharu kind of feeds to him, but he also eats the maggots that are crawling on the oh, body later. So that's gross. that's how he makes his way through his month in level one seventy one, and mm-hmm. it's uh it's a dark, dirty month. It's oh man, and I love just the detail of them waking up on one seventy one and. Trimagasi says, listen, you can hear people screaming because they've woken up and realized what oh, level. Yeah. But like that is such a creepy detail. Yeah. And you know what? I was uh just a little production info here is uh we were watching it and I was like, I bet they only made like two of these levels. And that's exactly what they did. They constructed oh, two yeah. levels, like sense. an upper and a lower, and then po- like digitally added the infinite looking sure, hole yeah. going up and down. But yeah, they. I mean, the construction of the cells is is great. It's very bleak. Yeah, it. it someone I I was reading a review that compared this to Cube as well. And yes. Yeah, yeah just I saw that minimal also. set. It, everything can kind of double as itself because all the rooms are the same. Mm-hmm. Hey, our sponsor this week is HelloFresh. What a fun, weird sponsor for this uh, <laughs> film. <laughs> Do you need food delivered to you on a platform from your ceiling? Yeah. <laughs> HelloFresh won't do that, but they'll put it in your doorway. That's yeah, that's close. Enough. close. Yeah. yeah, this food hasn't been picked over by <laughs> several floors of people before it's gotten to you. Yeah, HelloFresh meal kit deliveries right to your door. It was like maybe talking about foods making you hungry then. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, lots of uh, different recipes. Like they have the family kits of you maybe picky eaters. They got family meals, vegetarian meals, which is what we get. They're very, very good. Yeah, and everything's, you know, it's portioned out so you don't have to go through the stress of trying to measure things and trying to know if you're purchasing the right amount of food or if you'll be too little or have some some waste afterward. None of that Mm -hmm. with HelloFresh. Kind of like how the food in this movie is technically... If, technically, if everyone eats the right amount, there is enough food for everyone in the That's tower. right. Yeah. That's right. You can also add extra meals and stuff to your weekly order, too. Oh, like, man. The people in the hole don't have that option. They don't have, but you do. You can have, like, yummy sides, like garlic bread cookies and mm. stuff, which sounds so good. Right yeah, now. it does. <laughs> oh, apparently, HelloFresh's carbon footprint is 25% lower than store-bought grocery meals and the source for that is university of michigan oh yeah go blue yeah <laughs> so if you want to try hello fresh you can get 10 free meals including free shipping if you go to hellofresh.com slash deadmeat10 and again that's hellofresh.com slash deadmeat10 use the code deadmeat10 
10, dead meat one zero for 10 free meals for shipping. Lots of meals. <laughs> Buy dead meat if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually that month passes and he gets uh, gassed out again. Mm-hmm. And this time he wakes up on level 33. Yeah. That's, that's You're moving on up, dude. Mm-hmm. And his new roommate is Ima Guri, who already knows his name and who knows that he brought Don Quixote because turns out she's part of the administration mm-hmm. and filled out his paperwork when he volunteered. And her one item that she brought, man, is her, her fucking dog, dog, her little dachshund. Ramsey's the second. Ramsey's the second, and they call him a sausage dog. Yeah. <laughs> Which I guess maybe that's the Spanish term is like wiener dog for yeah. us, you know? He is a little sausage He's dog. He's a little sausage dog, here. you idiot. Why would you bring that? Well, because, you know, she, as she claims, did not realize what it was like in here. Yes, but she was diagnosed with terminal cancer and decided that when that happened to her, she would... Uh, voluntarily go in and I guess just try to make it a better place. I think that, yeah, her reasoning is she, because I, it's a thing where she doesn't know how bad it is, but also I think she recognizes that there's room to make it better or like that's her, because that's kind of the core of her character is she's the person who wants to work within the system to make it better. So she decides, yeah, when she gets cancer, it's just like, I might as well go in and and see it for myself, see where I've been sending people because this is something I've been doing with my life and try to improve it in any way that I can from the inside. Yeah, I wonder if she, I mean, she's a bureaucrat. I wonder if she's meant to be just be like uh the, the bureaucrat you know she's the person the, who works within the system and yeah. is just trying she's just to she's, do their part yeah she's the you know maybe I, I, she's idealistic um in the sense that she she genuinely believes that if you i think maybe ask nicely or you work within the system and don't put up too much of a uh not a fight but if you are just passionate enough about it things will change and and get better well that's the thing is she says that spontaneous solidarity will fix this place yes like meaning it just a random occurrence of everyone deciding oh we're all in this together which is not believable or realistic in any sense of the word and uh she to that end as well believes that the best way that she can make this uh, change come about is by she makes a little plate Mm -hmm. for the people below her. And then when the platform goes down, she yells down to the people below her and is like, hey, I have made you plates. Please eat from those. Make a plate for the people below you and pass on the message. Yeah. And those guys are like, fuck you. We were just on 150. Now we're up here. We're going to eat our fill. Yeah. So she has this belief in a system that maybe doesn't uh, jive with like human nature and yes. doesn't work with human nature. Although to her credit, she has this dog, but in order, because she believes so much in the system, she uh, will spend one day the dog eats, the next day she eats. Yeah. Like she's not taking double portions. She is the, um, I'm trying to think of a, of a good way to describe her. She, she believes in the system's potential and mm-hmm. thinks that it is inherently a good system but it's just humans are the ones that make it not work and if if we all just got our shit together then the system would be okay you know it's our fault it's not the system's inherently bad yeah and which which is like it reminds me of like the what is it like uh conscious capitalism kind of thing where it's like if we all act good if we're all good and behave better than capitalism works which... interesting because i also think of communism and if sure. you ignore human nature mm-hmm. communism would work but it never does because human nature like yeah it, it, it works both ways i think she is the adherent to a system that would work if human nature if were humans different. were perfect and but instead not... of trying to tailor the system to human nature you, she just continues to believe in the system and blame people yeah i think the reason i see it as a bit more of an indictment of capitalism specifically is she um and we see this at least you know especially within our own country the u.s is we we hold the people beneath us accountable for the system's flaws and i think a good example of this is we use uh we rely so much on charity to uh heal to to fix things that ultimately our our system 
should take care of. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So we we rely on GoFundMe to fund people's surgeries. We uh we pressure people to give to charity and to donate and we make it uh we put the impetus on individual people to do the right thing which ultimately a lot of people don't especially people who have lots of money it's relying on their goodwill does not work she's the type of person who is like you know oh you you want uh everything to be better well then why don't you donate to to homeless people or why don't you do this thing why don't you give people money instead of asking the government to do it for you mm-hmm. she is the yeah she's very much like this this kind of individualism uh or this idea of the individual being the good in the system versus oh wait the system is the thing that makes this impossible do you know what i mean yeah where we sh- we shame each other into fundraising and donations and yeah like like i said funding people's medical procedures and medicine instead of looking upwards and thinking well wait why can't we just fix the system so we don't all have to do this we don't all have to make the little portions of food and like count on literally every single person down all 333 floors to do the right thing which yeah. it's not gonna happen yeah yeah uh she only believes there's 200 levels for whatever that's reason. right she, we, she yeah. has uh so although she is an inside member of the administration that is doing this we learn that she does not have all the information because the the first thing she says is that there are 200 levels and spoiler uh the next level he wakes up on is 202 yeah and which like, i love oh, is shit, such, a, that's good such a good reveal oh fuck but she also when uh miharu goes through their level she says that miharu is not looking for a kid she came in she, she processed her paperwork she came in by herself right she's just an actor who's gone crazy and then later at the end of the movie, we find what is pres- who is presumably Maharu's child. I think it is supposed to be her kid. Yeah. Here's my interpretation of this whole plot line because I think it is a bit confusing. Mm-hmm. And I've seen a few different uh, interpretations of it. I I think that, yes, she did come in alone um, because uh, the administrator says we don't allow any under 16s in here. No children are allowed in the hole. Yeah. And yeah, we see at the end there is a kid in here. Mm-hmm. And so I think that um Haru did come in alone. I think she was interviewed by this lady. Um I think again this is symbolic of she is a a, a member of the system that inherently it's like it's weird she like believes people can be empathetic and that we all have a responsibility to act a certain way but then at like the turn you know like she instantly is so unempathetic to maharu and says this bitch is crazy she came in by herself she wants to be she calls her she wants to be the asian marilyn monroe or something yeah it's so easy to look again look at people who are struggling and uh, you don't know everything about them. And she's so unwilling to consider other possibilities like maybe she was raped in prison. Is this her oh. kid she had here? And she's unwilling to consider, no, maybe there is a kid in here. And this system that you believe in so much is is hiding it, mm-hmm. which ultimately, yes, it is. So she is, again, I think it's such a demonstration of how much she buys into the administration and how the administration is not what's wrong. It's everyone in here is fucking this up and everyone is failing at upholding the potential of the system, including this bitch who is crazy and is tricking you all. And it's kind of like the uh, maybe people who think other people take advantage of benefits maybe that's not like a direct i don't think that's you know explicitly what this is supposed to be but it's what it makes me think of like Mm -hmm. oh this person is just they have they have all kinds of kids they can get welfare and they're taking advantage of it and they're you know they're the reason why this doesn't work is these people who lie and even though we realize she's not lying and yeah, I think the the fact that she thinks there's only 200 levels just shows that that she's unreliable. It reveals later that the information yes. she is giving us isn't necessarily factual. Yeah, and it's kind of emblematic of the the way that the people who run this system truly don't understand how bad it actually is to be at the bottom of it. They don't even know where the bottom of it even is because yeah. they don't see it. They don't experience They're so it. They're out of touch. And right. that's probably why we get a few flashes of 
Floor Zero where they're making the food mm. and even the lighting and cinematography love, is very different. That's actually the very shots. opening of the movie. Is yeah, they, you see they, some of the food being prepared. They're preparing the food and I just thought of Pee-wee's Breakfast Machine and Pee-wee's Big Adventure. I think because there's oranges rolling down this oh, yeah. tube and I just <laughs> couldn't help but hear the music. <laughs> but even the coloring is different and like the color palette in the beginning is gorgeous. It's like this weird muted like kind of greens and pinks and it's really, really nice. Yeah, and one of the random shots we get of the food prepping is we see like the head chef lining up all his, his uh, cooking assistants or whatever mm-hmm. and he's... Uh, he's holding the panna cotta. Oh, is he? Yep. Uh, is that with the hair? Mm-hmm. Okay, and he I guess he found a hair in one of the foods, and he's, like, comparing it to all of his cooks, and when he finds the right one, he's, like, he really dresses him down. You see him yelling, and it's just, you know, serves as the contrast where up there, a single hair in a food is something to, like, be enraged about, whereas on the lower levels, that would be the last concern that anyone yeah. would have is a little bit of food. They're just hoping the people above didn't poop in their food, you yeah. know? Yeah. Which is ultimately how uh, Gorang gets the people below them to follow uh, Imaguri's demands yeah. to set aside like the plate yeah. for the people below them. Because like, asking nicely doesn't work. You have literally yeah. She tries it for like a week. Shit in their food. He's like, if you don't do it, I'll shit in your food. Yeah. And she's like, well, cool. Uh, I guess we gotta get the word to the people above us. And he's like, that's not gonna work because I can't shit upward. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite lines in this. I yeah, can't that's the shit funniest line to me. <laughs> I, I thought that was so great. <laughs> yeah, I love that he, this is kind of when you start to see him turn and maybe realize, because like we talked about, he he tells Trimagasi, look, I will blame you personally for mm-hmm. you hurting me. and for." But I think this maybe starts to mark a shift in terms of how Goring realizes things have to happen here. He realizes you can't just ask nicely for stuff to change, unfortunately. In a in a perfect world, yes. But they're all in the fucking hole. And we've seen day after day that her asking, it's a whole montage of her asking over and over and yeah. over again. It doesn't work. And finally has to be like, look, I'll fucking shit in your food <laughs> if you don't do the right thing. And I think that's when he realizes that as much as it feels against his character, because I don't, I don't see him from the beginning of the movie acting anything like this. I think this is him realizing that when you're this desperate, like this is what happens to you. And this is how you have to act to ultimately get someone to change for, you know, the benefit of others. And it's, yeah, I think that's like a big moment for him. I mean, that's when she starts calling him a Messiah yeah. jokingly, but mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, eventually they get gassed and wake up on 202. Yes. Proving Again, her words wrong. love this reveal. Yes, and immediately he wakes up and finds that she's uh, hanged herself. She's hanged herself, yeah. So, and, and uh, her apparition appears and says, you know, the reason I didn't throw myself down the hole to kill myself is so that you could eat me and survive. So you're welcome. Have fun with uh, my food, my food body. Yeah. Which like, Props to her. <laughs> I, I did. You wouldn't I, have survived 202 with yeah, that. Yeah. And again, I think that shows that she she really, she's an interesting character. Mm-hmm. Because at once she is so unlikable, especially the way she talks about Maharu, which we later find out is like totally off base. But also she. Oh, but also Maharu kills her dog and eats her. her Maharu does kill her dog and eat it. Yeah. That comes later after she's said that stuff about her. But yes, yeah, Maharu yeah. does in fact. But okay, so fair. <laughs> but so she she's interesting. Like at once she says these things where you're like, oh man, lady. But then also she, you know, she's very gray. Like she performs this act of sacrifice and is like, you know, I, I left my body here so you can eat it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's interesting. She's yeah. not, a, a, she's very like neutral, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, he gets through that with her body and I, I guess by eating paper, which I don't he think there's nutritional value, but he does start eating he his book. I think, yeah, I mean. I think it just passes through and you poop out some yeah. paper. I don't think that you're getting anything fiber? out of it. Yeah, but uh, that, that, that I think is the least amount of screen time spent on a level when he's on 202, which would be month three, right? Uh, yeah, well, we see him. Uh, there's a little montage of him 
he has the samurai plus the knife and he's making scratch marks on the wall and we're oh, thinking right. is he marking off the days because we see him counting on his fingers mm-hmm. he's making marks so we don't really quite know i mean i just assumed he was counting the days That's he was down me there too. later you find out he was counting the levels that uh-huh. the platform's going down he's to see how each second yeah to and see assuming how that there's like yeah he's counting each second that the platform stays on a floor until it gets to the bottom so then he calculates there's about 250 floors in the yeah. building so next time he wakes up is on level six. Bam. That is, you're so far up there, dude. Yeah. And that's with Baharit, uh, his new cellmate, whose yeah. one item that he brought is a rope. And he's trying to climb up out of this onto the next floor. Yes. And so he he asks the people above him if they can help him out. And they're like, sure, yeah, we'll fucking help you out. Throw us your rope. And he starts to climb up the rope. And right as he gets up to their level, we get an ass and poop. Literal coming out poop the, coming out of a butt. Poop coming out of a butt onto Bahar's face, knocking him down. Yeah. Uh, he, is, he is saved from falling further by Gorang. But I can't think of many movies right. There's a literal poop ass coming out shooting butt. out poop. I mean, probably one of the Jackass movies, right? <laughs> probably. Yeah, probably. Uh, so, yes, Baharit, our new character who is very uh, manic. He I he love is, him. He speaks He of, says he's on fire. Yeah, he says he's on fire, and he says uh, he's like a man of God. God's mm-hmm. on his side, mm-hmm. and he wants to ascend and get out of here, and he's on six. There's no better chance for him to climb up on out of this hole. Yeah, and then that's when he realizes there's always going to be, even if even if he got up to five, there's still always going to be someone who won't let you up. Yeah. They're not going to let you climb. And, you know, again, this movie's not subtle with its metaphors, but that's fine. I don't mind it at all. <laughs> uh, and then that's when he and Goring realizes that what if they go down? If they go on the platform and go down? Yeah. Because- oh, and this is this is uh, the beginning of Goring's fifth month. So it's important to remember he's on a very high level and after this, he only has one month mm-hmm. left. And even uh, uh, Trimagasi, the, the ghost of Trimagasi appears and is like, dude, just all just right. Just coast. Just fucking f- eat your fill for this yes. month. Yes. S- like live out your next month. You got your diploma. You're good. Yeah. And it, to me, reminds me of the kind of rhetoric we, we use when we look at, um, you know, people who they've made it. They, they've maybe struggled and they've finally gotten to a pretty good place in life. They're financially stable. They mm-hmm. have everything they could want. They're not the very top, but they're doing really well for themselves. Don't rock the boat. Yeah. You don't need to rock the boat. Um, You're you're fine. So don't concern yourself with how everything, you know. Yeah, it, like you made it out. You made it out. You're like fine. the system is so big. Like, you know, just enjoy your, you know, you've gotten so lucky. Just mm-hmm. enjoy it. But... Goring realizes he is in a unique position as someone who's really high up in this tower to fuck up the machinery of yeah. the hole, which I love. This yeah. is like, I think this is when this movie like really, really started coming together for me is this third act, him realizing we need to, it, like, you know, break the wheel kind of thing. I mean, they even say we, to, we must go down to go up. Yeah, it's a we very gotta go Daenerys down to go thing. up. And yeah. it, it is the... Again, not subtle allegory of if we want to break the machine, people have to be willing to reach down. They have to be willing to think of people that aren't themselves, to think of people that are worse off than them and do something about it. Don't just, you know, enjoy how lucky you are and how comfortable you are. You got to be willing to risk it. You got to risk it to help others if you want anything to change. Yeah. Yeah. So he recruits Baharat for this, even though Baharat wants to go up. He's like, no, man, we can do it. We'll go down and then... By the way, at the end of each day, the platform shoots back up to the top. Really fast. <laughs> really fucking fast. So I'm fast. like, are they just going to get tossed <laughs> I know. in the air? But he's like, if we make it all the way down, then we'll, we, we can go, go up that go way, up. you know? Yes. So to go down, we must go up. And he's like, what we'll do is go down to each level and we'll ration out the food and make sure people only eat their fair amount and we'll make sure that the people at the bottom get food today. Yes. Like, it'll be great, and this has never happened before. So they go down to level seven, and fucking Baharit's got this pipe that they took out of Holy their, like, bed. Shit. And he is he is yelling at those dudes, and he's like, back up. We're only going to give you a little food, okay? And Goring's like, no, man. No we food. ain't feeding anyone until level 50, because these people got to eat yesterday. They're fine. Yeah. They can fast for a day. Yeah. So <laughs> and this, this will guarantee that enough food gets down to the bottom. Yeah. And the people on level seven are pissed. They they literally say, I'm on level seven. I'm entitled to stuff yeah. my face. They yeah. say, I am entitled to do this. Because mm-hmm. again, they don't know where they're going to be next mm-hmm. month. Yeah. 
Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they they go down level by level, holding the people off, making sure nobody takes food until they find uh, a man who Baharit s- seems to recognize, a man in a wheelchair who yeah. he calls a wise man. Like, yeah, because Goring asks who he is and Baharit replies, a very wise man. That's all we yeah, get. Yeah, and this guy knows Baharit by name as well. Yes. So they have some kind of really, I mean, maybe a spiritual leader. Mm-hmm. Um, but this wise man, and I think he's fascinating, uh, because he he gives the advice, okay, look, oh, you guys are doing such a, so noble, like, great, good for you. You're standing in all the fucking food. Yeah, like, first off, you're is. standing in the food. You're fucking up the food. You need, and he, he, he emphasizes that you're being violent, and he even says your manners are terrible. <laughs> you need, and this is the, this is the civility argument of this yes, whole thing. Yes, dialogue, dialogue must come first. Dialogue must come first. Uh, civility, rhetoric. Um, and he tells them you need to send a message instead of, you know, like you need to have a clear message to for send the people at the top, for the people at the top. And he comes up with the idea. And I love this, that the clearest message to send to level zero, which is where they put all the food on the table, would be to have a single dish that is preserved. No one has eaten it. Something that people would normally eat. And he says the the. Panna cotta. Panna cotta, yeah. Panna cotta, sorry. Mm-hmm. And that's, what is that exactly? It's like a gelatinous cake? It's like a cake. cheese... Like okay, a, yeah, it's like a cheesecake kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, it's a... Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't look bad. I'm not a sweets guy, but it looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah. it's not uh, my favorite. But So yeah, they decide to just perfectly preserve that, and they'll take it all the way to the bottom and send it right back up, and that will show... What exactly? Just that yeah, they and did this? That, that, yeah, that they... Everyone in this jail w- was able to come together in solidarity and choose to not eat something and send it up back up as an act. But again, what, like what, what exactly is it? Yes. Yeah. And that, that's why I think the wise man character is so interesting because how wise is his advice really, mm-hmm. especially again, we're going back to like the, the idea of civility and manners and discourse. And he, when they get to the next floor, they even begin instead of just fucking beating the shit out of everyone. They're like, okay, here's what we're doing. We're, they, he tries to explain, like, we're saving this panna cotta. And everyone's like, fuck that. I want food. And they go for the table. And so it's immediately we see that, like, again, asking nicely when shit is this bad. Mm-hmm. Does not work. And it's not going to work. Well, I also think, but the other side of that is when he points out that they're stepping in the food. And I think that's pointing out that, like, they think they're going to help people, but uh, the way that they're doing it is also going to hurt the actual thing that will help people, which is food. Right, because they're stepping all over it. Yeah, because they're being like clumsy and, and too physical with yeah. it Yeah, but then also it's, um, to a certain point, the kind of symbolic protest. We even were both like, wait, but yeah, what does the panna cotta symbolize? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, like you can idealize a symbolic protest all you want but ultimately sometimes when something is this dire it's like what like what are we doing you know but i yeah i I see what you mean he does say well when that doesn't work you have to hit back yeah yeah i just imagine that when the panna cotta gets back up to the top they're gonna be like oh we should just take that off the menu no one seems to like it well that's (laughs) what i saw online some people were saying that they think the panna cotta scene from earlier is the, it literally is the panna cotta from the end, and it does get sent back up. That doesn't make sense. It, no, it doesn't. It. I don't think it makes. But people think the girl, that whole sequence is like not oh. real. Um, uh, I disagree with those people. I kind of, yeah, I do too. But <laughs> that, that's that just a. That I before there's like comment. I just like I've okay. seen that theory before okay. that they they do get the pan and they do. It's the it's the same thing where they're like. Oh well, no one ate it. There was a hair in it. They don't get the message at all. They oh. they were like, "Oh, no one touched it because there's a fucking hair in it." Oh, okay. Yeah. I can see that interpretation, but yeah, that girl ate that panna cotta. So. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. They they end up you know going down each level and they're they're doing their thing and we see all these people and I think we see uh is that surfboard guy no it's money guy surfboard guy money guy inflatable pool guy oh there is a guy with an inflatable pool and they're pool. both the inmates are just in there naked like in this little inflatable pool and yeah and they throw some food in it and then they splash around yeah. trying to get the food yeah uh, they find Maharu who's getting killed she gets killed yeah she gets killed stabbed and killed yeah and uh there's like a fight with the two inmates on that level yeah they get fucked up by these guys yeah dude Bahara gets uh 
Bahari gets fucking sliced with a sword. So yeah. One guy brought a sword. That's a pretty smart thing to bring. A sword, yeah. Yeah. They also the guy realize... Guy gets decapitated, too, in that fight. Yeah. <laughs> they also realize, too, that the platform does not stop if no one's alive. And yeah, because his calculations were 250, but that wasn't accounting for if the platform gets to a level where there's not anyone alive on it, it just keeps it on just going. Keeps going, so yeah. That's why it goes all the way down to 333. Yep. Yes, and that's like the last level... So, you know, they're real fucked up at this point. They've lost a lot of blood, uh, probably haven't really been eating that much, if mm-hmm. at all. And at the bottom of level 30, 333, which is half of 666. Yeah. Like, yeah. Again, if you do the, there's two inmates per. Oh, there so you go. There are 666 people, inmates. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they find the, the little girl hiding beneath the bed, and it is presumed that she is Maharu's child. Yeah. Which, again... Yes, I think a lot of this is muddled. I'm curious if any of it is like a translation thing. I don't know if it is, but I'm assuming it's supposed to be her kid. Yeah. And it's just, I think maybe she was born there or something. Mm -hmm. And she's just, I wonder if like, is she always, I don't know if she's always kept at the bottom or not. But I think, I think what, what it is, is like maybe Maharu like does every month go to feed her and that's why she looks pretty healthy okay yeah yeah. and i also wonder does she maybe not kill her cellmate does she kill her daughter's cellmate every month Hmm. i don't know i don't know honestly not sure like not sure the stuff with the little girl i think gets a little confusing yeah i would love Um, to read interpretations of it because yeah they get off the platform uh to go talk to this little girl and then the platform keeps going down below them into darkness there's mm-hmm. no floor below them but they still have the panna cotta, and even though it's supposed to be the message yeah they decide to they, give it to the yeah, girl yeah they to, realize the bigger thing to do is instead of like sending a symbolic sending this, message you know up. like no let's actually do the right thing and like make sure this girl gets fed because she's on the bottom floor this month yeah and yeah. uh baharit dies from his yeah injuries. he just yeah dies and, expires uh and it's while yeah it's during the middle of the night while goring is dreaming and he and his dream heart says like the girl's the message mm-hmm. so yeah i guess the girl's the message now so uh when the platform gets back down to him again he puts the girl on it and he's on it too and it goes down mm-hmm. into the darkness it's just like this there's just the, sub layer yeah. yeah it's just blackness and uh this te- is why people think goring at the end is like is dead and none of this is actually happening oh okay uh oh yeah yeah yeah. i could see that and trimagasi ghost appears and is like what are you doing on that platform guy and he's like well i'm gonna i'm, I'm the message bearer and he's like yeah. the message doesn't need a bearer yeah. so he just leaves the girl on the platform and gets off yeah and it's yeah i think i like the because i i think within activism and within you know protest there is uh always a tendency for certain people to make themselves into they're the message bearer they Mm -hmm. are the personality they are and that's a very dangerous thing to incorporate into a movement is like the idea of like a a big personality and and stuff is like or someone being a messiah Mm -hmm. um but instead choosing to just do the work and not necessarily take the credit for it or be the the center of attention about it and making it about you like no no it's about this girl it's about this message so they send the little girl back up yep and i was at first wondering like well what does this accomplish and i'm i kind of realized that if she goes back up to floor zero which is where like the chefs and stuff prep everything the chefs i'm assuming are kind of like our administrator character where they don't quite realize what is going on they think there's no children here yes they exactly don't yeah, they exactly. believe there are no so if the if the floor zero staff sees this little girl come back up then that's like hopefully the spark to something bigger yeah is it that's is, how i interpret is it, it as is well. finally something getting out of the the hole to where it begins like a domino effect of yeah is it eye-opening enough to enact change yeah, yeah. whereas the the panna cotta as like the symbol is like you know what do we do with this mm-hmm. kind of thing the little girl uh the the actual people that something affects is a more effective message than like some kind of weird symbolic thing yeah 
Yeah, is what I, I think the ending is going I'm for. I'm sure that's one uh, completely valid interpretation, and I'm sure there are many more of which I'd be interested in reading if, you, if you've if watched this and you have your own interpretation. Because that's the, that's the end of the movie. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, a lot of people are not a fan of the ending. I get it. I get not I get, being a fan. I get not being a fan of it, too. I, I was confused by it at first, like, when it ended. I was like, mm-hmm. I don't understand what... I was like, that's it? But I think thinking about it a bit more... Yeah, I think the point of it is to make you think about it, as opposed to, like, we see her arrive at the top, and we see what happens when she gets there, and, like, maybe there's a, a on-screen glimmer of hope of this system change. No, you gotta, like, do that work yourself. Mentally. Yeah. And maybe the idea of doing doing the work now, which the, it's always the hard thing about activism, is, like doing the self-sacrificing thing now to ensure that something is better for people who are after us, like people yeah. who come after us. Like we, there's that idea of like, well, why would we, I don't know, for example, like why would we make college free? I had to pay for college. Mm-hmm. I was in debt for years. I had to go through all this bullshit. Like Goring had to go through all this shit. So what? The little girl just gets to ride up on the platform. She gets to, <laughs> but that's the point. Is it's it's the decision to instead of becoming this messiah and instead of becoming the message of, and, be, and like making it all about you, you, you. It's like deciding to make the sacrifice of I went through all this shit. I'm gonna get no credit for it. I went through hell, but I'm I did it to make this better for people. I do, I I don't know this little girl. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's gonna happen to her. I'm not gonna be around for it. But I'm pretty sure what I did is going to make life better for her and therefore other people. Yeah. And that, I think that's what the ending is about, is that choice to not necessarily immediately see the results right away. And that's mm-hmm. like that's one of the hardest things, I think, about being an activist, being someone who cares about um, politics and issues that are currently affecting people is like change is really hard. Um, change is messy, as I think that's another big thing that this movie is is focusing on is that like yeah change is really difficult there's so much debate about ways to change things everyone's got different ideas on what's most effective the ending being so unsatisfying and leaving so many questions unanswered that's what that's what activism is yeah that's what caring about the future is we are not going to get those questions answered like that's what it feels like to push for something that you know is right you might not see the results of it and it but you'll make the future better for someone else you will never get to see it possibly but mm-hmm. like that's what it is you have to live with how unsatisfying that feels sometimes so i think yeah i think the more i think about it the more i like it yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah any other thoughts uh no I think it's uh it's it's just one of those movies where yeah it's uh it's primarily a thought experiment. Yeah, yeah. it is. And but it's it's also it's got some fun flair to it. I really like the music, the production design, the acting is fucking mm-hmm. great. I mean, it's always hard to judge acting from in a different language because you're not sure. It's a little harder. Yeah, yeah, like are they doing good acting? But uh, to me, it was great. I fucking love Tira. Mag- was Tira. Tree Mag- Tree Magassi. Yeah, it's weird because Tree Magassi. Tree Magassi. There it is. Yeah, I'm always down with a dystopian fiction. Has always been a an interest of mine. I, I love... even got to take a class in college just on dystopian and utopian fiction, mm-hmm. and uh, this fits right in. I love it. Yeah, I love dystopian fiction too. That's why again, I loved loved Disco Elysium so much. You really, you should really like if you liked this and you like dystopian shit. Yeah. It's it's deals with so much of the same stuff, like how frustrating it is to just want to do the right thing, but like circumstantially, it can be really fucking hard to do that. You know, mm-hmm. next week I think we're gonna do the podcast that I said we would do, and hopefully, no one gets mad at us. And I'll leave it at that. All right. <laughs> Listen, okay, I'll just come out and say it. 
I'm pretty sure. I'm like 90% that we're going to review Passion of the Christ. Man, that means we got to fucking watch that thing. I've never seen it. Oh, lucky you. I've, okay, that's that's part of the reason I want to do it. I've never seen it because I was not allowed to see it because, yeah. because, and this is why I think it's a totally perfect movie to review for the podcast because I was not allowed to see violent movies, so basically horror movies. Passion of the Christ is a fucking horror movie. Change my view. <sighs> All right. <laughs> it's just a gore fest. It was advertised as a gore fest. It was like this big forbidden fruit kind of movie where it's just fucking disgusting torture porn. Like, I I think. Was it the same year as Saw, maybe? It's early <laughs> 2000s. Like, yeah. I, right. I, oh, I love the idea of reviewing it through the lens of it being a horror movie because it basically was advertised as one. All right. There you have it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. Well, until that, I'm James. <laughs> I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Me Podcast. <laughs>